Hello, and welcome back to uh, Eastbed Overview Part 2. Um, I was cut off at the end of Part 1, and I apologize for that. Um, I was about to get ready to show you how to add students to the system. Um, there's a common misperception that uh, you have to email me, and I'm the only one who can add them into the system. Uh, that's not the case. Um, you're able to add students. Um, the way you would do that, you're on our student select screen, um, like I talked about in uh, Eastbit Overview Part 1. Uh, you can search by last name, first name, local ID. Um, like I've always said, uh, the, the most unique way to search for the student is through their local ID. That's the one thing that is unique to that child. Um, for training purposes, I don't have a fake ID that I could add. Uh, you always want to make sure that um, add from list is checked. Do not uncheck this box. Um, that can create all kinds of issues within the system, and we don't want to do that. Um, so I would click Add Student. It's going to pull up a, a separate window. And while it's pulling up, um, I mentioned yesterday that if the student were to enroll today, I'm not able to add them, and you're not able to add them into Frontline today, you would have to wait until tomorrow. Um, they would appear on this list um, in order for you to add them to EastFed. They don't just magically appear there for you to add them as a transfer um, if they were in as RTI 504, they don't just magically appear on your special ed side. You have to add them within the special education uh, art forms application. Uh, so when you click Add Student and you've, you've always got that Add From List box checked, this will pull up a list of every student in the district who is not already currently in uh, the special ed side of the system. Um, if I wanted to add this kid, I want to make sure that the last name, first name, local ID, campus, date of birth, all that is correct so that I'm adding the correct student. Um, don't worry if you add the wrong student. I can uh, remove them from the system, but that's an extra step. Uh, if you can just verify that you're adding the right student, you would click Add. I'm not going to do that because I don't want to add a real kid to the system and then have to remember that later um, after training in order to delete the student. so But you would click Add. Um, the student would disappear from this list. You would click Close Window, and then the student would appear here. Um, you could search for them, and they would populate. I'm going to reloading it thinks I added somebody. Um, and that is how to add students into the system. There's no trick to it. There's no smoke and mirrors. It is that easy. Um, Moving on from there, I'm going to go into a student record, and we're going to talk about PEAMS data. PEAMS data is very important. Uh, there's a, a common misperception in the district that if I were to do a transfer ARD or, or if the kid is speech only or something like that, uh, I don't have to address all the PEAMS data. That is not true. Um, there's also the situation where People don't check multiple disabilities or, or one of the PEAMS elements like that because they say it doesn't apply to the kid, um, the kid's just LD. But the system here does not assume no. You have to tell it no. Um, you are required to fill out all PEAMS elements um, and get this validate PEAMS to zero errors found. Uh, so for this kid, we started off with this fake student. We've got five PEAMS errors. If I wanted to know what they were, I can click this box. All I did was click, and it tells me the PEAMS errors. I want to clear those to where I get zero errors um, before I make a draft active, before I print it, uh, any of those following steps. If you, if you don't, as you're going through the ARD, your uh, document will print with the the words across it in progress in really big font. Um, that's not something we want to archive. That's not something we want to ho send home to parents. We want to take care of all of our PEMS elements. If I want to know what my PEMS elements look like, they are anywhere in the system that I have a pencil paper icon. 
So down here at the bottom, if I've got a pencil paper icon, that is a PEAMS element. Uh, I was kind of mentioning multiple disabilities before, um, and, and it doesn't assume no. You have to go in and tell it no. Um, just because I put only one disability um, or the kid doesn't meet the criteria, it doesn't assume that the, these are no. Um, so looking at these, I would just navigate through the system anywhere there's a pencil paper icon. Um, I'd make sure that PEAMS element is filled out. I'm going to go back to our PEAMS data screen, um, which shows all of the PEAMS elements within the special ed side of the system. So what we what I will go through is required. You must have at least a primary disability. Um, if the kid doesn't have a secondary or tertiary disability, those are not required. You must have an instructional setting code. You must have a speech indicator code. You must have multiple disabilities to say yes or no. You've got to have child count funding. You've got to tell me whether the student is enrolled in the RDSPD. Um, and just because they're auditorily impaired doesn't mean they're RDSPD. Um, your teacher of the deaf would be there and they would be able to tell you whether that student is RDSPD. Um, if the student is served or enrolled in the RDSPD, then you would have to tell me who the RDSPD provider is. There's only one option in that drop down. Um, if the student isn't enrolled, you're allowed to leave that blank. Um, ECI is always a no, but it's required to be filled out. Um, early childhood special education services. Um, any student between the ages of three and five, that's a yes. Um, I know I get this all the time. Well, the kid's in kindergarten, he's not in ECSE classes. So I said no. That's an inaccurate uh, statement. Uh, the student is eligible for ECSC services up until their sixth birthday. So anytime we're serving a student, whether they're one years old and they're, they're auditorily impaired or visually impaired, something like that, all the way up until their sixth birthday, this would say yes. The system automatically the night before their sixth birthday flips this to no for you. If they are six or older, this is no. If I say yes for the ECSE, or Early Childhood Special Education Services Indicator, I need to do um, a service location code. If you want to know what codes those should be, if you will look in our um, ECSE section of your Special Education Handbook that you received, um, there is a flow chart that walks you through how to determine what the service location code is, whether it's zero through eight. Um, interpreting services, um, yes or no, it's required. Medically fragile is required. Assistive technology is required. And dyslexia, yes or no, um, is required. If you are in high school, the IEP continuer code is required for any student prior to their 18th birthday. So if you're having an ARD and the kid is 17 and before you're going to come back and do your next annual ARD, they'll turn 18. Please make sure that you put the IEP continuer code on. Um, it talks about that criteria uh, if I were to go to that element. Um, you must make sure that all related services have a start and an end date. Uh, one of the errors that this is throwing for me when I looked is audiological services doesn't have a start or end date. It's not going to let me process through until I put a start and end date there. Um, We'll get more into start and end dates and services. You'll get more into that when you go into our boot camp um, and other things. Um, one of the things that you will always do, um, so this is a common mis misperception too, um, on when and when not to create a draft within the eSped system. Let me be clear on record right now. Um, if I'm working on an FIE, I don't need a draft. If I'm working on a reeval, I don't need a draft. If I'm doing a revision, a transfer, or an amendment art, I don't need a draft. A draft should only be opened for an initial ARD as well as for an annual ARD. Our, our directive from our office is that those are opened at least two to three weeks prior to uh, the annual ARD taking place. Um, that gives your teachers time to put their PLAFs and their goals and objectives into the system and send those home to the parent as our expectation from the district is that those go home to the parent uh, 
no later than five days prior to the meeting. Um, we understand situations happen, uh, things come up, but our expectation generally is five days prior to the meeting. Those goals and objectives and the PLAFs should go home, as well as the progress reports for how the student's doing on if they're uh, already in special education. That being said, if there is a draft open, you would continue if you're working on an evaluation and draft. That can get confusing. If you want more clarification on that, feel free to shoot me an email. Uh, my email, like I said in part one, is jfrost, that's J-F-R-O-S-T, at PasadenaISD.org. Now let me show you how to get in and create a draft. It's real simple. I'm gonna come into this, this regular record. The first thing I'm gonna do I'm going to click my screen drop down and I'm going to scroll all the way. You don't have all these screens, but it is way down here on the bottom somewhere for you, right around 100 and something. It'll say Process Draft Record. When I click Process Draft Record, I can't, I, I don't want to mess with anything here. I just want to click this button that says Create Draft for Billy One DSS. It's going to say, Are you sure this will take a few moments to complete? You say, OK. It's copying his information and it copies everything from his record in special ed from what was in the current active record to the draft record. And in one of our, our later videos here today, we'll get into reactivating the draft. But now you can see there's an active and there's a draft. That is the extent, takes a couple seconds to create a draft. Um, now I'm going to go work in this draft because this is, I've got a draft open. Let's assume and pretend that his ARD's coming up in two to three weeks. Okay. Um, to create reports, let's say I've gone through, um, and you'll get more detail of this um, as you go through ARD boot camp and, and more more in depth and, and drill down trainings where we drill down into this information. Um, but let me show you the reports. So I, I've done all my information on the screen. I want to generate. Uh, I want to generate the the final PDF document that I'm going to archive, um, and that I am going to print out and give to the parent. You could do reports or print archive. They both work the same way. I'm going to teach you on reports because that is my personal preference. So I'm going to click. If I've followed all my steps, I don't have any PIMS errors. Then I'm going to click Reports. It's going to pull up a bundle. You want to do full art with supplements um, and pick from this bundled list. When you start getting into trying to create your own, there you run the risk of missing certain things. But let's say I've, I've done my annual art. I'm going to click Full Art with Supplements, and I'm going to tell it to create. It's going to say it's working. It's going to kick me to the View Prepared Report screen. If I've turned on the auto refresh when I set up the profile, uh, which was covered in part one of this ESED overview, it's going to refresh for me, so I don't ha I don't get carpet tunnel sitting here waiting for this thing to refresh. Now that it's done, I can click view, and here in a second, it's still thinking. There we go. Um, you will see. Like I told you, if you don't correct all of your PIMS errors, you get this in progress all over your paperwork. That's what you don't want. Um, and you, you could think, well, it's in progress. They'll, they'll never notice. We do go in and uh, review and spot check the archive manager to make sure that this is not happening. If it's an occurrence, you get an email or a phone call from me um, asking why we did what it is that we did. So this is generating reports. I could then from here click print, print this bad boy, um, and send it home to the parent. Um, if I wanted to archive it, I can go from here, from view prepared reports to archive prepared reports. And in the next video, I'll get, I'll I'm going to start off uh, in part three with archiving, and then we'll cover uh, making this draft active again, art invitations, and where the consents are located. I hope you have a great uh, rest of your day, and please reach out to me and let me know if you have any questions.